I am a kindergarten teacher and I have been teaching for nine years. Um, so that's like, that's my true passion. Um, and I mean, that's kind of the biggest thing about me is that I'm a teacher and I love working with kids. The summer of 2018, I started noticing um, that I had an increase in bowel movements and it just slowly got worse and worse um, to the point where I was going up to 20 times a day. And so uh, January of 2019, I kind of finally said enough is enough. I need to um, figure out what's going on. Um, so I went to the, my doctor and we just uh, decided to do um, blood tests and a colonoscopy um, to kind of get to the bottom of it. I should add that part of some of my um, other um, symptoms were a little bit of blood in my stool and pretty soft um, stool, which wasn't really that normal for me. So colonoscopy, you do a prep before and um, you start like five o'clock, but the night before you don't get to eat anything all day. Um, you start this prep drinking this stuff. It flushes out your system. You wake up the next morning, drink a little more, flushes you out the rest of the way. Um, and then you just check into the hospital for, it's um, just an inpatient procedure. Um, you're sedated, so you don't know what's happening. And they just can go in and look inside your bowels. Um, I went in for my colonoscopy on February 11th and, you know, um, when I went in for it, I was actually really worried that they were just going to say, um, we didn't find anything. We don't know what's going on. I never, cancer never crossed my mind. Um, other things like Crohn's had cro crossed my mind, ulcerative colitis, um, but not cancer. So I woke up from my colonoscopy and my boyfriend at the time was there with me. And, um, the doctor came out and, um, told me he had found a tumor and, uh, my world basically came crashing down. Um, that was not what, not, not the news I expected to receive at all. Um, he was, they hadn't even done the biopsy, but he said, um, you know, I've seen this many times before and there's not a doubt in my mind that it is cancer. Um, so from there, everything was fast tracked. I went straight in for some blood work and, um, everything just went really fast from there. You know, I went from you have a tumor to calling my parents and letting them know what they had just found. I started with telling my parents because I am extremely close with them. So they knew I was going in for the colonoscopy. They knew I'd been struggling um, with uh, the, my problems. So um, that was an instant for me to call my parents. You can't worry about um, hurting anybody's feelings that you don't tell right away. Right. Um, it's not, it's not, not their journey. It's yours. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you just have to do it when it's right. They staged it at 3B. And so, you know, they said, you know, this is the protocol for this kind of for rectal cancer. Um, you're going to start with your, if you start with five weeks of chemo and radiation, you can do your chemo by pill. Um, which for me, that was, I was still really active. Um, so that was what was perfect for me, but I had to take it five days a week for five weeks. Um, so I got the weekends off. I really had not a lot of side effects. Um, and I did really well. I was going to the gym every day through that first five weeks of treatment, um, and continued my active lifestyle. Yeah. Um, Actually, and teaching in the classroom as well and did the radiation it's nothing like you envision I you know I, I don't know what I envision but I didn't envision what happened to me I mean you just go in this room they played the music I like I laid on a table and this big machine kind of went around me and made some beeping sounds and then I was out um, it's silent you don't feel anything um, you can have side effects from it, like burning. Um, luckily, I never experienced any of that. They said you'd have a small break. 
you'd go through a surgery, remove the tumor, um, have a temporary ileostomy, and then finish up with cleanup chemo. You know, for me, I just, I made a, I told myself early on, I was going to make a positive out of a negative situation. And that was just being really open about my story, um, sharing so that hopefully number one, anybody going through a tough time can be inspired, but also, um, anybody going through cancer, we definitely, I definitely looked at other hospitals, um, but from the begin, that was more later on in my treatment. Um, in the beginning, I trusted where I was at. I trusted the doctors that I had. You know, um, there was a lot of research behind rectal cancer and the treatment plan. So I trusted the treatment plan. Um, I felt really great about my surgeon. He had just come from another area and um, came very experience. So I felt really good about where I was at and all my treatment. All my doctors were amazing. They ended up removing my tumor and giving me an ileostomy. I ended up losing my large intestine and some of my small. So my ileostomy is not, cannot be temporary. It is permanent. But for people going through this process, it would normally be a temporary thing. Uh, for about six weeks, and then you get reconnected back up. That was a really hard time, probably the hardest part of my whole um, journey so far was um, this chunk of time that I had to spend in the hospital being completely helpless and dependent on everybody. Um, it was a really difficult time. Um, and I came through a lot of things that doctors did not expect me to. When I went in for surgery, they didn't know that I would actually come out. The first thing I remember is trying to talk to everybody and nobody could understand me. So I was trying to sign language with them because I teach my students how to sign and nobody knew sign language. So then I was trying to write messages. Um, I was like super thirsty and just really uncomfortable and in a lot of pain. Um, and just really had no idea what had just happened to me. It, I mean, it still took being out of the hospital to under fully understand what I went through when I was there. Mine again was not quite straightforward. Um, I went a lot longer not being able to eat just because I kept they kept having to go in, um, and I had to be my bowels had to start working again, which took longer because I kept getting put under. Um, but your bowels have to wake up and they have to see a certain kind of output before you can try eating. Um, and then once you start eating, it's just learning how to manage your ileostomy or your, I mean, you can get a colostomy too. Um, but it's just learning how to manage that and change that and all of that stuff that comes along with it. I mean, I had no idea what a an ileostomy even was going into this. And even when I was told in my treatment plan, I still didn't look it up. I figured I'll cross that bridge when it comes. That bridge, it came a little faster than I had planned. So I just woke up and I had this bag and had no idea what it entailed. I had a really amazing ostomy nurse um, who was very incredible and she helped, she taught me a lot. Um, but a lot of it was also just self-research um, and learning stuff on my own. I became part of ileostomy groups on Facebook where I've learned a lot through. Um, and I would say that's like one of the biggest ways I've learned. And just like when you empty your bag, getting it in the cup and not everywhere else. Um, you have to learn how to change it. So like you have a wafer that sticks to your skin and that only lasts so many days. So you have to learn how to like cut the hole for your stoma and put that on every so many days. Um, so I guess like throughout the process of being in the hospital, I was learning how to do all of these things as well. So even just like figuring out how to dress after was a really big obstacle. 
um, and finding tools to help me dress and just feel normal. Um, you would never know I have my ileostomy just looking at me. Um, it's all very hidden. I would say it's, I still struggle with this at times. I'm very used to what my body used to be capable of. Um, it can be frustrating being 32 years old and not being able to do what I used to be able to do. Um, but you need to give yourself grace and um, accept the new body you have. I mean, these bags save your life in, all, in, in the realm of things. Um, most people that have a bag wouldn't be here today if they didn't have the bag. Um, so I had to learn to accept that. Um, I had, to, I mean, I've definitely worked with a counselor um, on just accepting it, um, feeling good about it, being in a relationship and having a bag and being intimate. I mean, it's all a lot of obstacles to um, get past. Um, but there's a lot of people out there that are willing to share ideas and stories um, that can help you through getting, having an ileostomy. So once I was strong enough to go through clean up chemo, my team had me come in for um, scans that just um, kind of give them a baseline of what everything, how everything was looking. In those baseline scans, they found that my cancer had spread to my liver. Um, again, not the news I was ever expecting. I've never even crossed my mind that that would have happened. Um, so it was definitely another um, really hard conversation. They decided to continue. I was supposed to, I got these baseline scans. I was supposed to get my my port on Monday and get start chemo. They decided for me to keep my, get my port still. And then um, they had to kind of come up with a new plan um, of treatment for uh, cancer that had spread, which is considered metastatic. I still wonder how I got through all of these like moments. Um, I remember when my doctor called and I was in the shower and I still answered and just crying. Um, I think you have to allow yourself to still grieve. Um, but then for me, just continuing on and still sharing my story and um, kind of continuing, you know, doing what I love is really important to me. You become, cancer can kind of become your story and like what is all like consumes your life. That's the topic all the time. Um, so still just having a little bit of normalcy um, was important for me. My students are a huge drive for me to even keep fighting, in all honesty. Um, I adore them, and I want to be a good um, role model for them and just persevering through whatever life throws at them. So that's um, really important to me. And so, yeah, just kind of continuing to live my life. Um, and just take the news in stride and allow myself time to cry when I needed to cry, but then get back up and keep going. And I'm a big planner and I like to know what to expect. I like to plan and uh, stick to that plan. And cancer kind of like kicked me in the ass and said, you better lose that right now. So I had to learn very early on that I couldn't plan. I had to really just take it day by day. Um, honestly, when they told me I had tumors on my liver, there wasn't, I really didn't felt even feel like I needed a biopsy to confirm. I mean, I already had cancer. The mm -hmm. fact that it had spread was not shocking. I still didn't really realize just what met metastatic cancer meant though, mm -hmm. um, that you never, you're never, you're cure, you're treatable, but you're not curable is how the doctors describe it. So I never get to escape this, this is always going to be part of my life. Um, and that's something I still struggle with from time to time. That's a hard realization. Yeah. Um, but again, I kind of allow myself to feel those feelings and then continue on. Plan was to start with, um, I think eight rounds of chemo is like the cleanup version. I ended up going through about 13, I believe, um, just because they kept 
trying to get my tumors a little smaller in order to do procedures. And so it was kind of back and forth, like you're going to do eight and then they would kind of reevaluate. And then they were like, well, we want you to do two more rounds. So I went back and forth a lot. I never really knew just how many um, I was going to end up doing, but the intravenous chemo is definitely a lot rougher. I like to think, uh, well, when I was going through it, I like to think I was doing really well. Um, but looking back, it was very miserable. Um, it made me extremely sick. Um, a lot of vomiting, no appetite. Um, you get a cold sensitivity from it that is terrible. So I couldn't eat anything cold or drink anything cold. I had to heat everything up or else it felt like kind of like shards of glass in your mouth. Even the cold to step outside and we live in Montana and I was going through this starting in September. So I had to go through this in winter as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'd step outside and just to even breathe through my nose, my nose would feel like pieces of glass in it. My fingers, it hurt my fingers to touch anything cold. Um, I would say the cold sensitivity was definitely a really big thing. And then I ended up with neuropathy in my fingers and toes. Make sure you have a good, um, nausea, nausea med. That was helpful to me. Um, but just staying positive, um, knowing that it's temporary and that you will get through it. Um, Use the people, your support system around you. Um, when people ask how they can help, don't be afraid to ask for things, which I am not super good at. So, um, but I mean, if it's that you need a meal, don't be afraid to ask people for those things um, so that you can focus your energy and your strength on treatment and fighting. Um, so I got scans. Um, I'd go through some rounds. They'd do some scans. They'd check in. Um, I started seeing some doctors down in Portland at OHSU. So they were all collaborating and talking about my case and deciding what they felt was the best plan of action. Um, it's been a lot of back and forth because mine hasn't been super straightforward. Um, so yeah, I would just go through. So they might like decide one time they're like, oh, I'll do two more rounds and then we'll do scans. Um, so I kind of went through that a lot. So again, just having the, just being able to kind of take it day by day um, and one treatment plan at a time, not looking at the big picture, um, just kind of looking at, okay, what is happening now um, versus, okay, they're gonna do this and then this is gonna happen because that doesn't always doesn't always work out that way. I mean, there was a time I was going to leave for a procedure and they called me the day before and canceled it. Mm. So you just never, you don't know. And so I found that setting my mind to something didn't do me any good. So I went through targeted radiation and an ablation procedure as well uh, during that time. So ablation was done on my liver and targeted radiation, which is called SBRT, was done to my lung. SBRT was, I mean, painless. Again, kind of like radiation where you're just in there. I did have to do some breath holds. So I had to hold my breath for like 40 seconds, um, which was the toughest part. <laughs> and I had to do that like 15 times per treatment. So I did five days of this um, and I'd come each day and go through the same thing. But they just, I mean, they do some baseline scans and some mapping, and they give you your tattoos um, that help line them up. And then, yeah, again, it's just kind of painless, and you don't really know anything's happening. So Y90 is where they insert radioactive beads into, um, they inserted them into my liver. Again, they did a bunch of mapping to kind of check um, through my arteries to check how my blood flow went through my liver. Um, they didn't wanna put these beads in and just have them go all over um, and ruin parts of my liver that are still good. So they focused on my right lobe first and um, they put like a catheter in um, to block blood flow to certain parts of my liver. Um, and they do this all through an artery in your groin. Um, 
And so it was like a day of all this mapping and then figuring out the best path to insert them. And then the next day you come back and they insert the beads. Um, it was an interesting procedure. I didn't realize how, um, just like going in through your groin, that major artery, how big of a deal that was and how serious that can be, that actually caused me the most pain. And that you're awake for it all because you have to hold your breath at times. So you're sedated, but aware and able to hold your breath. So like, I can see all this stuff going on, um, which is a little freaky. (laughs) Think about just that this is kind of like my new norm, I guess. Um, It's just gonna be a part of my life, appointments, scans, um, kind of a, a, a constant fear but also just being thankful that I'm here and embracing the time I do get, regardless of how long that is. Just listen to your body. And, you know, if you feel like something's not wrong, go to a doctor. And if they don't listen, go to another doctor. I've met um, other ladies on this journey that were not as lucky and did not have a doctor that listened as well. You know, it's easy for them to sometimes say, well, you're too young. Um, then they're not the doctor for you and you should seek advice somewhere else. But just being proactive, don't, I mean, it's easy to worry about the cost of a doctor's appointment, the cost of a scan, but I guarantee you the cost of what you would get if you are diagnosed with cancer is far greater. Um, So it's just important to just be on it finding the silver linings has been like my biggest, um, my biggest thing and tool for getting through things. Like, um, it's easy to get bogged down by all the crappiness and hard times. Um, but just being able to find little silver linings, um, for me, like my sister and I didn't have a relationship, a very good relationship before all of this. And a huge silver lining is that we do, you know, the things that it's done for our family are big silver lining. So I just try to find those. And sometimes I have to dig real deep for them. Um, There's things that have gone, happened, and um, I've had to dig deep for them. But I always try to find a silver lining in everything that I go through um, to help me get through, through it and just remind myself feel like when you go through cancer, you're constantly shielding everybody from your real feelings. You're shielding them from the fact that you're fearing dying. You're shielding them from the fact that you have a pretty major illness. You know, you're always shielding people and not getting to really express yourself exactly how you might want to. And a counselor is just a great way to be able to let those things out without having to protect anybody else's heart or feelings. You get to just go there and talk and it can be what you want it to be. And I have found it very helpful. You know, it's your journey and it's, you'll, you'll find what works for you. Um, but don't be afraid to reach out for help and ask for help. Um, there's lots of really great groups that you can find to help you. Um, counselors are very helpful um, and uh, just stay strong and positive. <laughs>